Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you once again to this historic webinar, New Frontiers in Tourism, Hospitality and Tech, the first ever dialogue between the UAE and Israel in the fields of hospitality, tourism and tech. Now, it's an incredible, incredible time in, in history, really, that the hospitality and tourism industries here in the UAE and, and Israel are, are facing, especially with COVID-19 and, and the signing of the Abraham Accords, we're seeing new opportunities, new threats, new trends, as well as new markets to take advantage of. Um, and here we have an esteemed um, selection of pan panelists and, and leaders in, in hospitality and tech fields to talk us through what exactly it means for us. Now, before I go on to introducing them, we'd just like to go through a couple of um, house rules, namely um, to kindly ensure that you've got uh, our dear panelists, uh, your mics on mute when you're not talking. And for our dear attendees, um, should you have any questions, and I'm sure you have very many questions to ask, um, we kindly request that you just uh, message um, and type out your questions on the group chat and we'll be able to um, feed those to our panelists on your behalf. Now, um, amongst our attendees today, we're absolutely delighted to have um, tuning in um, Mr. Gerald Lawless himself, um, former CEO of Jumeirah and a titan of hospitality here in the region and around the world. So Mr. Lawless, a warm welcome to you today. Now, just a brief overview in terms of how exactly we're going to be um, running this webinar. Uh, we're going to start off with a couple of um, select panelists' uh, questions, questions that we'll be directing to, to our panelists here today, um, followed by open questions from you, the audience, uh, or questions that we'll be fielding to all our uh, panelists. Should you wish to jump in, esteemed panelists, please feel free to do so. So without further ado then, we'd like to introduce um, our esteemed panelists here today. We have, Doc, uh, we have Sanjay Sharma, uh, Head of IT for Jumeirah Group, um, whose portfolios include the world-renowned Virgil Arab and Manna Jumeirah. We've got Florian Krikbaumer, um, Chief Operating Officer of Interrail. We've got Vladan Pantelic, Director of Growth, Hoik. We've got Gal Schaefer, um, coming in from Israel, um, co-founder of Ventures Consultants, and coming in from Israel as well, Dr. Aaron Ketter, tourism advisor and senior lecturer of the Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management at Kinneret College. Esteemed panelists, a warm welcome to you. Now, we've had Europe Basically, um, under lockdown right now, the UK is seeing, um, you know, it enter into its second week of a four week lockdown. France and Germany have followed suit. Now, Dr. Aaron, I'm just gonna post this question to you. How, what really is your overview of, of the glo global tourism flow and how has this, these series of lockdowns impacted outbound travel from Europe at the moment? Thank you, Brian. Um... We're now in the middle of the darkest hour of global tourism. We're seeing, according to UN WTO data, tourism in 2020 gonna drop by some 70%. And if we're talking on Europe in particular, so Europe currently, most of Europe currently is under lockdown and less than 11%, actually 10.7% of Europeans are only 10%. Um, of Europeans are planning to travel outside of Europe in the coming six months. So generally people refrain from traveling and if they are traveling, they would like to either to travel domestically or to travel within Europe. In recent years, we had both Israel and the UAE had a booming winter season with tourism coming from Europe. And this year obviously is going to be different. However, at the same time, the recent news we got yesterday regarding the vaccine, might um, signal that this is the beginning. This is not the end, but this is the beginning or might be the beginning of the end. And as we start to rebuild tourism, 
one should look at the new opportunities that emerge, opportunities in tourism, in hospitality, and travel tech. And on top of these opportunities, we have this new cooperation being built between Israel and the UAE with 28 planned weekly flights between uh, Israel, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. Um, and today we are making history. We are laying today the first brick in this bridge of successful tourism cooperation between Israel and the UAE. So uh, thank you and um, shalom and salam alaikum and hello to everyone. That's wonderful, uh, wonderful words there and uh, definitely an optimistic outlook, no doubt, um, especially with the signing of, of these Abraham Accords. I believe the first plane actually landed in Dubai um, about two days ago, bringing the first batch of Israeli tourists. So definitely new opportunities there. Um, now, um, Sanjay Sharma, over to you now. Uh, we've obviously seen hospitality industries and hospitality businesses and tourism businesses experience what might be the biggest challenge um, to them in, in recent memory. Uh, and you obviously being in Jumeirah have been at the forefront of that and have experienced that firsthand. Um, and obviously we have um, undergone a series of lockdowns around the world um, and think we're very much past that stage. Um, looking forward then to a vaccine very much on the horizon, um, what do you think really is a, do you care to give us a quick overview of the, of the challenges facing hospitality post COVID? You know, I'm not sure whether I would say it a challenge, you know, I would say that this is a new norm now, you know, and the biggest transformation what we have seen in the last few months is about, uh, uh, is around human behavior. I think that is going under a huge transformation. We have seen an accelerated digital adoption, especially related to how uh, we digitally commerce, but it's not restricted to that, you know, we have surprise, Brian. As of now, almost all the individuals want to consume Jumeirah's product and services through different digital channels. So this is this is really something which is uh, which is different. And um, you know, if I could just share with you a new mantra for IT, especially where they are saying it's not only mobile first, it is actually mobile first and remote first. And what they mean by remote first is that in this age, our consumer want to get service in any location wherever they are. Uh, or if you just take the example of, uh, um, sorry, someone is saying sound is not clear. Uh, 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 can anyone else, uh, I mean, confirm whether they can hear me or not? Uh, there is a bit echoing, I would say, Sanjay. Um, um, I'm so sorry. I'm, I assured that I'm not uh, on any other device. So, so you might have to live with it if it is not a big problem. Yeah, so just coming back to remote first and mobile, um, mobile first. So I think our consumer want to get serviced um, uh, wherever they are. You know, they could be at a remote location near the beach, but they want to consume Jumeirah product products and services. Uh, they could be in the room and they want to have access to the dining facility or dining features. Um, they could be walking and they want their product to get delivered to them. So this is something which is happening on the consumer side. I must confess the same thing is happening on the employee side as well. You know, our employee now want to ensure that they can service their customer uh, sitting anywhere, you know. In other words, the, we have seen an accelerated cloud adoption also um, the, uh, during the last few months. You know, in summary, if I say that uh, uh, human behavior is going under transformation and uh, it is IT, I believe, which will play a very, very important role, or technology which will play a very important role um, to bridge uh, that particular gap. I'm not sure whether you have uh, followed this or not, but um, considering what was happening in the last few months, um, uh, we were able to quickly curate new products and roll it out for our consumer. You know, when the staycation uh, things came up, uh, you know, we were quickly to react to the market and create those, uh, those kind of products. Then we also realized that there is a new kind of requirement coming up during the COVID time where our consumer want to 
a consumer has a preference to stay in villas rather than the rooms. So that's why if you go to Jumeirah.com site now, there is a particular section which focuses only on these kind of products. So I believe uh, there is a change which is happening in human behavior, and I believe IT will be playing a very strategic and important role in future to bridge that gap between uh, consumers and the enterprise world. Thank you, Sanjay. And I think you're right in totally saying, I think this whole new mantra of remote first, you know, what we've seen, you know, as soon as lockdown started, um, you know, coming into play all around the world, video conferencing became, you know, such a huge thing. And I've had big video conferencing startups really kind of swoop in to, to sort of pivot their solutions um, to all sorts of businesses all around the world. Now, Gal, um, if you could just chime in here, how are you obviously working day in, day out with, with startups and with entrepreneurs looking to sort of get into, uh, to share rather, their, um, their um, solutions to, to problems facing businesses. And obviously with the advent of COVID-19, we've seen a large range of problems, problems you know, that um, a whole load of businesses are facing. Now, how can sort of these verticals, these entrepreneurs sort of pivot their solutions to hospitality and tourism related businesses? Yes, thank you, Brian. Now, obviously new opportunities for startup to pivot their solution is other industries are facing the same exact disruption. A hotel lobby shares many similarities to lobby of an office building or an airport lounge in terms of capacity of guest crossing. Also, a hotel room has many similarities to a plane seat as the other wants to, uh, the guest wanted to be 100% sterilized following the last user, right? So I've recently been focusing on user-centric solutions that have been proven effective in other industries. And I would like to present you with three Israeli founders that are in pre-feasibility stages of POC with the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, which is a strategic business unit of Jumeirah Group. So please welcome Jonathan Eller, founder of Aqua Purity. Please, Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, thank you very much for having me. My name is Jonathan Heller and I'm the co-founder of Pool Purity. Since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, people are scared of illnesses and swimming pools. This is a significant problem for hotels and resorts, as you can imagine. Our AOP technology developed with the Israeli government and leading universities effectively kills pathogens in water, including coronavirus, and makes the water healthier and safer. This restores confidence to the bathers and guests with up to 70% increase in swimming pool users that we've seen in municipalities. We've been kindly invited by Dr. Ned Carney of the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management in Dubai to showcase our technology to Jumeirah Group in, group in the Academy Swimming Pool. I thank you very much, and I look very forward to this opportunity. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, and Gal, you did mention you had a couple of other um, entrepreneurs um, here on the call today. Yes, please. So the next step to introduce is Nimrod May, the commercial director of Sonarax. Nimrod, please show, showcase your product. Hello and uh, marhaba, everyone. Uh, my name is Nimrod and I'm uh, Sonarax chief commercial officer. And I'm here to tell you about our ultrasonic data over sound waves connectivity protocol which operates with any mobile device and commodity speaker and microphone. The main commercial use cases uh, for such technologies are in the machine-to-machine -machine pairing, peer-to-peer -peer touchless payments, which is very important during the COVID-19 pandemic, location-based services and engagement. Um, hotels and malls uh, managers can interact with the customers in real time. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, we developed the most accurate contact tracing platform in the world, which uses sound waves, uh, which does not have a false positive effect, such as Bluetooth that travels through walls and ceilings. And I'm very delighted uh, to announce here that we're gonna be implementing our uh, Sonar XE contact tracing product at the Jumeria Hospitality Academy in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nimrod. Um, and I believe you have one more entrepreneur um, on the yes. on call. Please, uh, I'd like to introduce you with Wari Friedberg, VP Sales of Aura Air. Please, Wari. Hi, everyone. Salam alaikum. Nice to meet you all, and thank you for your time. 
My name is Roy Friedberg and I'm from Aura Air. We developed the world's smartest air management platform, a plug and play solution that will detect your indoor air quality in real time monitoring, will adapt the functions and the recommendations based on user behavior algorithm. And finally, will purify and disinfect the air, the air entirely from different viruses, bacteria, fungus, and mold, including the coronavirus. The company is nowadays operating in more than 44 countries, hospitals, hotels, and schools, working with global corporates such as Hilton in the US, Peninsula Hotels in Hong Kong, and Sheraton in Taiwan. We are looking forward to execute soon a POC in one of the hotels in Dubai. And thank you so much for listening. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Please, Brian, thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And um, I think it's safe to say that like these entrepreneurs, uh, we have a lot of people, I'm sure, that are tuning in today from Israel that are looking to, to move into the UAE to sort of incubate their ideas and, and you know, incubate their sort of startups. And potentially people here as well within the UAE, um, entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs listening in that might have an idea to, um, in terms of incubating sort of their startup ideas. Um, I'm going to, Vladan, just address this one to you. Um, you have incubated your startup um, uh, here at the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, and you've brought it up, you know, from, a, from an idea to a very much a viable business model. Um, what is, for the benefit of all our, our listeners here, um, what is really the startup e of ecosystem of the UAE looking like right now? Um, thank you for the question, Brian. Um, basically, just to answer through my two cents to this question on how it's ecosystem looking through my eyes and my experiences, I would like to divide this into uh, three sort of categories. Uh, one would be actual startup experience, incorporation process, etc. cetera, uh, landscape that I am continuously observing and going through as well. And a third one, it's mentoring and leadership sort of thing, uh, learning. So. Uh, when it comes to incorporation experience, uh, I also initiated incorporation in Singapore and Hong Kong, obviously. Uh, and uh, I, I must say that UAE is definitely in front, front in terms of efficiency. Uh, to incorporate basically startup, it took me 30 minutes um, in our one of the free zones over here. Uh, and also um, one of the biggest challenges that I found internationally when I was incorporating startup was um, uh, opening bank accounts. Uh, and in UAE, that was done in a period of one day while uh, I must say in Hong Kong, it took me over four months and hundreds of pages of physical paperwork to do such things. So I must really give a, a good uh, mention, I would say to UAE government for um, making this really seamless and digital. Uh, when it comes to the uh, second point, uh, startup landscape, um, in order to know what it takes to succeed in UAE as well, we have to look reasons for, uh, for businesses failing. Uh, so a large number of UAE startups that don't succeed fail to the uh, cash flow management problems uh, and overly ambitious acceleration plans uh, that are almost heavily uh, reluctant on the funding itself. Uh, the words such as bootstrap and value uh, need to be heard more often here by the startup as well uh, and focusing on the solutions that actually resolve the problems and are agile developed uh, not only from a technical standpoint, uh, but also from the management of the entire business uh, standpoint. Uh, chasing purely capital without sustainable solution is not the key. Again, uh, as we can see example of many startups that happen here, uh, and on the investment side, that brings failure to the, obviously, to the investors. Irrelevant to our B2B or B2C, providing value and resolving problems is, uh, to improve products and services needs to remain priority for all the startups. Uh, at the moment, I see more as being a hype over the substance, uh, and I think post-COVID, this will revert back to the substance and value uh, over the hype and the marketing dollar spent behind that. Uh, at our startup, Hoik, uh, we are continuously looking to uh, improve our value proposition and make ourselves uh, available to small businesses uh, that are at the heart of the economy, as we know. Uh, because I've noticed in my corporate lifetime and while I've been in Dubai for the past 15 years, everyone talks small businesses and how we can create something for small businesses. But unfortunately, lately, something is coming out tangible in terms of the solution. Uh, and we are aiming to change that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, learning and mentorship. Um, startup ecosystem, uh, I believe in UAE lacks mentors. 
uh, that uh, have experienced startup, that have actually uh, go to the process of doing the startup and co-founded the companies down the road, even if those companies have failed. I think that will be a huge learning out uh, uh, curve for us here. Uh, at the moment, I frankly do not see many mentors that actually have startup experience or incubators that have the uh, potential um, to develop the startup uh, and entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's where I see Israel really can uh, be a key partner in navigate and evolve our entire learning process in terms of how we can see uh, in terms of mentorship and learning to uh, evolve the startup scene in UAE further. So these are some of my three cents uh, and later I can be open for questions as well. Perfect, thanks very much, Ladan. I think you made a couple of uh, very valid points there. Um, on an unrelated note, Ladan uh, is a proud alumni of, of the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management and his startup Poik um, was incubated here at the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, um, which is one of, uh, I arguably the first um, incubator of hospitality related startups here in Dubai. So thanks very much, Ladan, for that uh, for your insight and input. Welcome. I just want to maybe flip um, things around here because I'm sure as well we've got some audience members um, from the tech industries that are looking to potentially uh, venture into hospitality and tourism related solutions, given the impact that you know COVID uh, perhaps has potentially had um, on hospitality and tourism businesses. So. Gal, I'm going to address this one to you now. Um, what can tech do, really, to provide solutions for hospitality and, and tourism businesses? Well, Brian, tech can do quite a lot. You know, as of today, just focusing in Israel first, there are over 7,000 active startups. 300 of them are travel tech startups. And I assume, assume that over 500 startups have pivoted their solution to COVID-related issues. Right? There are many more user-centric use cases to be tested. And some are active, such as using a voice to control IoT devices, and some are passive, such as leveraging AI data out of sensors. Now, Sage, Sanjay was mentioning uh, before the digital transformation. So there are also many B2B solutions to leverage data to generate more revenue by optimizing the hospitality IT system, right? The question is how far the hospitality leaders are willing to go in terms of adopting tech innovation and how will it affect the guest experience? The solution must be implemented in a way that the guest experience is not affected by issues such as privacy and the data must be 100% secured at all times. Brian, mm -hmm. to you. Yeah, um, that's some good points as well um, for all those and some good insight as well into the um, startup culture in, in Israel, which really is one of the um, booming hubs for, for tech and startup uh, currently in the world. So thanks very much for that, Gal. Um, now, Florian, we haven't quite um, gone over to you, but I'm gonna address this next one to you. Um, you yourself are an EHM alumni and have held uh, positions in hospitality related um, businesses in the past. Uh, we focus, we've been talking a lot about B2B in terms of how hospitality um, and how tech rather can help provide solutions to hospitality businesses. But obviously a key element of, of the travel and tourism industry is, is the customer experience and the, the guest experience at the end of the day. So that B2B, B2C focus rather, um, I want to kind of touch, up, touch upon here. Um, how will these solutions um, impact sort of guests of hotels and, and restaurants, just the end consumer? How will that impact the, the end consumer? Sure, yeah, thanks, Brian, for the question. Um, maybe touching a little bit on what Gal just said, you know, one of the areas to, that is more and more pronounced now is the collection of data and the security and privacy concerns that come with that. So that is a huge consumer impact. And I think one of the points here is actually to turn it back a little bit to the vendors like us, for example, and obviously the, the hospitality companies um, addressing, for example, what uh, Sanjay had said earlier about where they are pivoting their operation in Jumeirah a little bit is to make sure that in these kind of areas, security and privacy, the consumer is not actually impacted. For example, by thinking very hard, what kind of data you actually want to 
uh, collect and what whether you want to store it and what you have to store it, what you actually need it. And I think that is a, a prime factor that will in the future impact the consumer experience because you know, as we've, we've seen also in the broader technology world, you know, companies like Apple or Google, they have a very different approach of how they, they treat the privacy and, and data protection. So I think that's an interesting point. Um, the other aspect that I found always interesting in, in hospitality sort of the last 10, 15 years, and since I was in the, the vendor side, the, the trend has been in the past that hotels often were the first ones to provide new technology. So talking about flat screens, for example, or high-speed internet. You know, that was 15 years ago or so. Nowadays, it's a little bit the other way around. The hospitality is a bit the laggard that's uh, coming behind the consumer market. So really, the, the expectation from consumer isn't really to see a lot of new things, I think. They just want to be able to do what they're already doing in their own homes. So if you look at uh, hotel room, for example, um, guests might want to stream their content from their phone to the TV. And uh, that's something that companies in the consumer space have solved you know, five, 10 years ago already. In hotels, that is just being solved now and it's slow and it's a bit painful. So I think making these kind of experiences possible when the guests are away from home is one aspect of what is expected now by guests. And the other area is probably looking at what other industries are already doing. So there's always been this typical case of what uh, airlines have managed pretty well by, by now, which is you can come to the airport and leave the airport again at your destination without ever talking to anyone. And uh, hotels are trying that as well. They're trying to replicate that experience. So the kind of no touch uh, check-in, open your room, check out uh, process. And it's happening, but it's, it's very slow. And uh, one of the reasons for that, and I think this is an interesting point of why we're here is to make that kind of stuff happen, you need collaboration between a lot of different systems. And uh, if you look at the past, there was communication between the property management system and the point of sale, for example. Uh, that's still there, but nowadays you also have uh, communication, as we just heard from Gal, between a voice assistant in the room and the thermostat, for example, to control the room. So all of that needs vendors to collaborate and to interact and provide interfaces between their solutions to provide that kind of guest experience. And this is, I think, one of the areas that hopefully this kind of relationship between uh, the UAE and Israel can, can foster in the future. So that would be my uh, answer on this point. Thanks very much, Florian. Um, so great insight there as well. And I, I, Sanjay, I mean, as obviously head of IT for, for generic group, um, do you want to add to any of what Florian said? Yeah, I completely agree. You know, Florian said I always uh, tell it to um, uh, uh, share it with uh, in some other forum also. You know, unfortunately, hospitality industry is lagging behind, and you know, the customer doesn't want anything. You know, they have liquid expectation. Whatever they want, they have experienced it in their room. They want to experience the same thing um, in the hotel room also. Uh, I agree with it. You know, I remember that um, sometime back we launched first of its kind touch wall, you know, so we could just go to the wall, touch it, you know, so, um, uh, and I remember when we launched it, it was, the, those were the, I mean, the kids were the first one to experiment and see that how it works, whereas all other individuals are very skeptical before touching it. But this is what's, what's happening, there is uh, the digital behavior of uh, the millennial is ha has completely transformed in the last few years. And they expect that whenever they go to um, uh, uh, any organization, they should be able to experience it. They compare the best digital experience they have uh, on any channel versus uh, the channel where they're experiencing the services. In Jumeirah.com, they want the e-commerce experience of Amazon. Um, while ordering the food, they want to ex they want to have the experience of Zomato. Um, you know, you, you name it, and they 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 need it. So I, I completely agree with Florian on, on on his point. Thanks very much for for um, chiming in there, Sanjay. Um, so. Ladies and gentlemen, we just want to take this opportunity to once again stress that, you know, if you do have any questions, um, anyone who, who's tuning in at the moment, um, you're more than welcome to once again, just type those questions out um, and we'll happily re relay them um, to, to panelists of your choice or to all the panelists um, who may wish to answer. So 
Thanks very much, uh, everyone. We're now going to move on to just open-ended questions from the audience. We do have a couple of questions that have come through, um, which I'm going to ask uh, uh, at the moment uh, just to all of you um, esteemed panelists. Uh, feel free to chime in. Um, well, I guess mainly we're going to start off with uh, just addressing our uh, Israeli-based panelists here at the moment. Um, now, Israel being a leader in tech and the UAE being a leader in hospitality and tourism. So what opportunities then will this, will this collaboration bring? This is an open-ended, uh, yes, feel free to answer anyone if you have any, any um, input at all to add. I think well, Brian, that, I'm sorry, please. Got it, please. Uh, just to, to mention that we are, same as you, are very excited about the Abraham Accord and it will surely stimulate the process of uh, the engagement in tourism between the countries. Um, the first flight between, uh, tourist flight between Israel and the UAE was this week. So it's a historic week for us. And uh, I think the Israeli startups are looking to scale up and engage with the uh, UAE um, companies, if it's hotel chains, uh, airlines as well, because you are a gate for a region of over 1 billion uh, people. So it's a big opportunity for Israeli technology in this aspect. And more to say about the academic opportunities, I will leave uh, more for Iran to say about uh, this side. Uh, please, Iran. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, both Israel and the UAE has several common characteristics when it comes to tourism and serving some tourism markets. And with regard to these markets, um, which are tax savvy, which are young, which are dynamic, which are open to innovation. So there is definitely a joint need and a joint opportunity and there's a lot for participants and for professionals to learn from both countries. This is regarding the travel tech industry and regarding from, for the academia. So uh, we already starting um, a discussion between Kinneret College and the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management regarding students exchange and staff exchange, both on the bachelor levels and on the master levels to see um, how we can bring the, um, the startup ecosystem and the beautiful um, hospitality knowledge, uh, the, the high professional hospitality knowledge that there is in the UAE and create new thinking and new solution, fresh ideas to coming out of it. That's great, Dr. Aaron and Gal. Thank you very much. And if I could just perhaps get now our UAE-based panelists to chime in. Um, so basically- sure. um, I think on this point that there's an, something to add here that is, is quite practical, I think, and that is already happening on the collaboration between the tech community and the vendors also. So what I've seen in the last few years is that it's usually rarer to find a kind of single company to build something that adds a lot of value to the ecosystem. A lot of the time it's multiple companies collaborating together to own some entire solution, let's say, maybe a mix of software and hardware and service or something like this. So in our case, we've already been in touch with an Israeli startup that is developing a kind of AI based chatbot for hotels. So you can basically type something as a request or to control your room. And they are willing to work with us on doing chatbot based control of the guest room. So controlling your lights or your AC. And that is an interesting use case when you look at, for example, at uh, people of determination. So that have challenges to move around in the room. So if they could uh, control their room from their phone with a chatbot, that's a really nice application. That is only possible if you have companies working together. And this is already happening. So I think there's real practical value that, that can show quite quickly um, in opening these uh, opportunities, because you have a bigger pool of companies that can work together. Thanks very much for that. 
So we're just going to move on to our next question then. Um, so once again, open to all panelists here. Um, given the, the current situation um, when, you know, obviously budgets are being cut at the moment and, and businesses are less willing to invest more and more on perhaps new technologies, um, how would you be able to convince hospitality industry to invest in tech? Well, you know, maybe I can take this question and um, I would be uh, more than happy if anyone want to uh, jump into uh, what I'm saying. But I believe budget is never a constraint. Uh, you know, I, I, I strongly believe in that. Um, I, the challenge is how do you actually present the budget? Um, you know, let me share some interesting statistics with you that um, if you see the average hotel spend or average IT spend in the hospitality industry, is close to 3.3% of the total revenue. Whereas if you see the um, uh, uh, spend for the hoteliers who have actually got, uh, who have actually adopted the digital transformation uh, as part of their strategy, it is up to 5.5%. So that's, that's a huge money. Um, I, I strongly believe that you know if you have the right use cases, for example, for you was talking about how you will provide a new experience where you'll be able to control do the you'll be able to control the in-room technology using Champot, or for example, it could be a very simple use case of introducing um, RPA um, uh, to manage the operation better, so that you can actually optimize the cost uh, for the organization. Um, I'm not sure whether you will get a lot of resistance there. But you know, if you just take, if you just focus on two areas, one is customer experience, other is employee experience. And if you present the budget better, um, I believe that uh, you should be able to get what you want. Yeah, I agree with this. I think it's it's almost, sounds a bit controversial, but it's almost easy because now you have a lot of opportunities for things that uh, have changed in the last few months and the consumer expectation has a bit uh, shifted. And that provides an opportunity to go to hoteliers and say, hey, you need to do this because that's what consumers expect now because that's what's going to save you money. And another example is voice. I think Gal mentioned it earlier. So voice control in the room, sort of two years ago, people were like, is this really going to work? Are people really going to use it? And the jury is still out. But nowadays, people are asking for it. Why? Because nobody wants to touch stuff. So voice control sounds like a nice uh, solution for this. We we'll see if it's going to happen, but those guys are on an upward trajectory. Same with things like virtual events. Yeah, there is opportunities now that come. You just need to, as uh, Sanjay said, you need to find the right uh, buttons to push to get a hold of that budget. But the opportunity is there. Just to add uh, from my side as well to something that Florian mentioned earlier as well. Um, I think hospitality does invest in tech, uh, but as Florian pointed out, uh, collecting right information, I think it's also important to invest in the right tech. Uh, often we are, uh, as uh, Floria mentioned, we are combining a lot of solutions and then data decision is not consumed at the right speed uh, in order to push these businesses and move forward. So I think often it's said for hospitality, data rich uh, and uh, analytic sport or uh, actionable intelligence sport. So I think that has to be reverted uh, towards the right tech. It's not only the tech, but the right as well. Uh, real time, it's really key. I want to add to what my colleagues have said, you know, because of the situation, the return models are being challenged in the industry. So there is now more importance of performing active inside POC and demo of the solution, right? So in a certain period of time. So we as tech leaders must suggest new ways to measure the KPIs of the project, especially those related to safety, hygiene and IoT, in order to convince the industry that they can find direct returns and move to production stage. Um, one additional point um, is that we're expecting to see in the coming few months is that uh, demand will recover slowly, but there's definitely going to be more supply than demand. So we're going to see an enhanced competition and tourism brands and hospitality brands that will be faster to adopt innovation and based on the innovation will enhance their competitive advantage will be better able to compete and to win the um, people who are looking forward to travel again. You know, I just want to add something. You know, I'm sorry for being controversial here. You know, 
uh, I was having innovation at Enderscope uh, some time back, and I strongly believe that the age of POC is gone. You know, enterprise don't want to invest more time um, in doing POC and then basically trying to see that how they can take it to production. Um, in Jumeirah Group, probably we will never take that approach any uh, then, uh, now. You know, it is better to find out the product and then find the right partner so that you can co-create the solution and mold it um, based on what uh, the customer wants. Maybe that is uh, uh, a new model. Would any one of our panelists like to, to weigh in on that? I take the opinion that Sanjay, after all, is the client, <laughs> uh, Jumeirah Group. And um, I have to say that uh, I am more than surprised of how quickly things are moving since the agreement between the countries has uh, been signed. And we already are in uh, um, stages of partnering, in stages of uh, demoing, in stages of, of uh, engagement between Israeli startups and uh, the hospitality industry in uh, Dubai. And uh, that's uh, very optimistic in this way, and how quickly things are moving in these terms. Uh, just to add to what Sanjay mentioned uh, of era of POC is being passed uh, by, I think from startup also, I think MVP uh, are the products that you can still sell, but also test in real time environment and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, check out all the things that are doing uh, well or not doing well. But I think as I agree with Sanjay on this point, I think era of POCs uh, and checking out uh, is solutions viable, testing it out. Uh, I think it's slowly going away and we're going directly into it. If we have a value proposition, uh, businesses, I think will invest it. No, uh, you will have to find that. Well, thanks very much uh, everyone for, for chiming in there. And obviously um, audience members, if you have any sort of opinions that you'd like to share, you're more than welcome to as well. Um, do you agree with Sanjay? Do you not agree with Sanjay? We'd love to hear from you. And Sanjay, uh, you just actually quite leads, uh, leads quite nicely into the question I'm about to ask. Um, you touched on um, the employee experience. Um, when I know for a fact that we might have a couple of our attendees here who are looking to venture into or who are perhaps currently in the um, the uh, the hospitality and, and tech industries, or perhaps you know somehow in between, um, how would you nurture sort of the right talent within these two industries? Once again, it's an open-ended question for anyone who wishes to answer. So, um, Brian, your question is that how do you nurture the talent? Is it? That's right. That's a very interesting question. You know, I think uh, um, I've been blessed in my career to work for two organizations who are known for uh, their brand. You know, first I was with Emirates, and then I I am uh, blessed to um, now be working with Jumeirah. And uh, I must confess that both these organizations invest a lot of their time in training the in, uh, training the employees. And I believe this is the best way to at least start the career. I remember that in the Emirates, uh, there used to be a program called Naju. And uh, trust me, guys, when uh, any individual or any crew used to go for this training and they used to come out, they used to be proud of the fact that they work for an Emirates. And the same thing is with Jumeirah also. I'm pretty proud of our induction program, which uh, everyone has to go through, whether you're joining as head of IT or you're joining at any other level. Everyone has to go through. And I think that gets you into the culture of the organization. But after that, it is really important to ensure that you empower the individuals to take the right decisions and to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, drive the organization forward. And this is what I believe is, uh, uh, is the key mantra for Jumeirah. Uh, and that definitely help an individual to nurture their career, not only professionally, but also in all the competencies which are required in the enterprise world. Uh, I'd like also to add to what uh, a question about employee experience. It says, I think employee experience and customer experience are directly interrelated. Uh, so that's one of the problems we are resolving at Hoik, where we have two solutions, one catering to customer experience and one on employee experience, and then we are merging those two into really actionable insights. 
so coming back to the employee side, uh, we are really looking to change the way the employee experience is approached from the onboarding to the offboarding process uh, and have that sort of uh, continuous ongoing feedback but turn into the analytics and insights that are really actionable to improve employee experience and other side also that will benefit customer experience. Uh, what we also developed uh, earlier with a few of our uh, MVPs uh, is also monitoring sort of customer experience sentiment, uh, employee sentiment versus the revenues to see how one imp impact each other because they're definitely correlated. Uh, just to add a few sentences from our side because this is what we actually do at Hoik, uh, customer experience, employee experience is our expertise. That's great, Vladan Sanjay. Thank you very much. Um, and just like as we've obviously heard about, you know, things being done to nurture talent from sort of big multinational corporations, Emirates and, and Jumeirah. What about sort of from a startup sort of mentality? Um, you know, Vladan, Florian, feel free to, you know, chime in here. Do you feel like the, the fundamentals of, you know, employee and, and nurturing sort of talent very much remain? Or are you looking to do things a little bit differently within your companies? Florian, you could go ahead first. Sure. I went through this a little bit. So I obviously studied at uh, the Emirates Academy and uh, that was a broad course that was focused on a lot of different areas. But I knew from the beginning that I didn't really want to work in hotel operations. I wanted to get some experience how a hotel operates, but then I wanted to figure out how to make it better with technology because I like technology. And I think that the difference potentially between the larger organizations and what happens in a smaller company or in startups where, where I came from is that you usually have the ability to get a lot more exposure much, much quicker. And that is quite critical, especially in technology nowadays, because there is very few jobs and it sounds obvious, I think, but it's, it's still very true where you don't have to deal with technology and getting a lot of exposure very quickly will help you no matter which area you're getting into. So just from our technology point of view, for example, essentially, if you want to boil it down, one of the pieces of equipment we do is a thermostat. And that is an engineering topic in the past, but it's no longer. Yeah, nowadays, all thermostats, they talk to the door lock system. They talk to the property management system. Um, we have interfaces to mobile apps so you can control them. So all these things, they suddenly start touching no longer only an engineer that runs around with a wrench and you know fixes a pipe. It's uh, an, an ecosystem of different solutions. And getting that exposure very quickly and very early on will really broaden your horizon. And I think that is a way to, to grow your career quickly, um, as opposed to being mm, very narrow minded or very limited in, in the exposure you get if you, you know, live in a small departmental bubble, let's say. And startups often help that because you're forced to do a lot of things. Because there's just not a lot of people or a lot of departments. And Brian, I just want to add one thing here. You know, if you see the enterprise world also, they are also looking for the same kind of culture in the organization. If you see the DevOps model, or if you see how uh, now the Scrum teams are forming up, it is all about uh, collaboration. It is all about uh, individual getting access to different domains. So even enterprises, enterprises are more hungry for such culture uh, um, uh, in the organization. Uh, just to add from my end as well, uh, because I was a part of the corporate for more than 13 years as well, uh, obviously in Jumeirah Group, but also finding my own startup, uh, just to add that, uh, I think it's important to avoid the politics uh, in the, in the no matter how size of the business is, is that either it's a large corporate or a small, I think it's important to communicate directly to decision makers that can change and uh, allow you to progress and innovate. And what I found often is that, you know, in corporate world uh, compared to the startup is obviously very difficult to innovate uh, in terms of the, speed so uh, you know you might have the idea but until that idea reaches a particular stage or gets approved uh, it sort of already gets uh, almost outdated so i would say uh, agility it's very important and speed uh, in terms of innovation as well uh, aside of uh, as floria mentioned um, you know i was also not a tech guy uh, you know i worked in corporate and i studied as well in emirates academy uh, but I managed to pivot by learning all these fundamentals about technology into the technology. So I think it's important just to give a shout to the participants as well. Uh, you know, you don't have to be an expert in coding to be part of the tech. Uh, I think you can be part of tech by just learning the fundamentals and also seeing how you can create a solution that actually resolve problems uh, for the businesses. 
Some great points there, everyone. Um, and nice as well for us to be able to touch on organizational culture, um, which is relevant in, you know, regardless of the, of the industry that you're in. So thanks everyone for your input on that. Now I'd like to, um, we've got a very good question here, which I'd like to um, ask our Israeli-based panelists. Um, where is the best place to find some data on Israeli traveler booking behavior and online purchase path insights? Care to chime in, Aaron or Gal? So um, we're very lucky to have a very solid database that's conducted by the Israeli Ministry of Tourism that's, that's serving outbound travelers that are coming, both outbound and inbound travelers coming to Israel. So we have that as a solid knowledge base for tourism to Israel. Um, if we're looking into that and if we're looking more at the global and, um, and regional um, understanding, so we have available data that comes from the OECD, from the European Travel Commission, and from the United Nations World Tourism Organization that the joining of this or uh, triangulating this piece of data can help us to understand how consumer um, may approach um, technology, tech, and what would be their openness to consume such solutions. Thanks very much, Dr. Aaron. Um, yes, I think you got some, um, some Definitely some points there in terms of, you know, the Israeli tourism ministry, there being a good source of, of data uh, for you to be able to, to look into and to tap into. So thanks very much for that, Dr. Aaron. Um, we've got as well another question here. Um, once again, open to all our panelists. How long would it take for hotels to drop their own developed apps? and look at a globally acknowledged white label hosted platform that adds value and increases upsells. Is the, and is the market ready to adopt um, such a new paradigm? I can try this one. So I used to run product development for a apps company in hospitality basically. And my answer might be a bit controversial about it because my answer is not about how long it would take. I think they won't, is my view. I think they want to control that app experience because they want to use it to differentiate. And it's such an important interface to the customer that maybe they will outsource the development. Maybe not all hotel chains will build a big um, R&D department for apps, but I think they want to own that experience end to end. And that is much more difficult with a white label solution. So my view is that, sorry. Yeah. you know, I think it's funny. I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm pretty shocked with this uh, uh, question. I'm sorry to say this, but why, why would uh, I take a white label uh, app? You know, the, the, there are a few things which are very important uh, in the digital age. Like all of us are talking about the data. The moment I have this white label app, I'm not sure what kind of data I have access to. Uh, the second thing is, uh, which is really important for our operation and commercial team is to manage the experience. You know, it may happen that uh, we would integrate with open API-based uh, solutions, which could uh, come in form of profit, uh, property management systems. It could come in the form of uh, our uh, um, in-room control uh, systems, door lock system. So we want to definitely integrate with these systems. But at the end of the day, this is just a presentation layer. It's nothing more than that. And so we are just designing the experience there. So that's why it's really important that the the hotel, just like any other entity, um, we control this experience and we see that uh, how we uh, provide the best experience to our consumers. That's a great insight, uh, Dr. Sanjay, um, especially you know, you just obviously being at the helm of IT for Frictionary Group. Would anyone else like to chime in? Um, I, I want to I want to add to what Sanjay said. You know. Um, Coming out of, uh, I used to be a business development for a large uh, user experience firm, service uh, provider. And uh, I see the importance of uh, the user experience of the front end of the apps, and of course, connected to the back end. And as Sanjay said before, it has to be an Amazon type of experience. And I think uh, bringing the Israeli side, we have much to offer in terms of uh, the best user experience um, world known apps 
uh, for hospitality. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Gal, for your insight there. Um, and um, we're just about sort of approaching the end of our session. So I'm going to try and, and squeeze one more um, question in that we could potentially touch upon. Um, as hospitality companies continue to innovate and adopt new technologies, what are your views on the risk of this leading to commodity and the dilution of the unique hospitality? For example, digital check-in might remove the whole personal touch, the whole personal interaction um, that perhaps guests might crave. And how do you see this being addressed? So maybe if you don't mind, I'll take this question and then please feel free to add in. Uh, you know, Brian, there is a difference between digital and technology. And uh, often uh, few individual uh, uh, use technology instead of digital or digital instead of technology. Here we are talking about the experience. We are not talking about, I'm talking about the technology. And whenever we talk about the experience first, and foremost thing is to design the right thing first. You know, it will be a shame if uh, from the luxury industry if you remove the human touch. But in this digital experience, we need to ensure that technology empower the right individual to greet or to provide the personalized customer. So we need to we need to see that how we can use the technology to curate the digital experience. So this is, I believe, is the mantra. And I don't see any overlap between the technology. And the end of the day, Brian, we need to give options to an individual. If I am coming to my to a hotel and I want to go straight to my room because I have a business meeting in the next 30 minutes, I should be allowed to do that. Whereas if I'm coming with my family and if I want to get greeted, I want to get escorted to the room, I should have that option. Technology can provide that opportunity for the business to curate that experience and uh, to curate the digital experience. That's what I would say, Brian. You're quite right, Sanjay, and especially in terms of, you know, when you mentioned remote first, uh, I might want to be on a beach and might not want to be disturbed while I'm getting my suntan on, um, but might wish to have perhaps place an order remotely um, without having to interact with anyone. So you're right in saying that you're right, new technology and, and user experience or guest experience are in fact really compatible. Um, as opposed to contradictory. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we've got um, another question here that I want to also just address. Um, are there any programs for Israeli students to come for academic study um, of tourism management at the UAE? Um, yes, as a matter of fact, the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, um, one of the top 10 hospitality um, schools in the world is based in the UAE. Um, and we'll be more than welcome to, to welcome you um, and any other Israeli students looking to, to join us um, as well. Now, um, we're approaching the end or very much at the end of our, our webinar, historic webinar here. Um, I'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists. I think you've given us a lot to think about and I am obviously aware of the fact that there are questions that have yet to be addressed. Don't worry, we will definitely um, take note of them and share these with our, with our esteemed panelists so that they'll be able to respond to you as well. Um, everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, it really has been absolutely wonderful and time for me anyway has flown by um, quite like that. Um, so. We'd like to thank once again our esteemed panelists, um, the entrepreneurs as well that have joined us, um, and to you ladies and gentlemen in the audience for your great questions. We trust that you've taken away um, some valuable insight from this session. If you do have any questions at all or would like to get in touch, you're more than welcome to send us an email at info at eahm.ae um, and we'll be happy to answer any of the questions or hear from you um, should you wish to get in touch with us. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>